So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Nasser Mir. I'm a professor of race, identity, and citizenship at the University of Edinburgh. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this Scottish Parliament and Festival of Politics event on uh, transatlantic and the legacy of transatlantic slavery. So we're delighted you're able to join us uh, to participate in this. And um, this is an event which is co-organised with our colleagues from the Coalition for Race Equality uh, and Rights, as well as the International Development Alliance. And of course, in some respects, equally relies upon you all, um, because we'll be encouraging you to participate with comments uh, and questions in, in the second half of the panel. So this session is organised with a 30-minute with a discussion with panellists and a 30-minute discussion uh, with the members of the audience. We, we hope very much that our conversation today can join others happening uh, across Scotland um, and helping to understand um, what sense the, the, the past has uh, in terms of a bearing uh, on the present. Um, and something which our speakers are, are exceptionally well-placed uh, to, to lead a discussion on, uh, and whom have, in many respects, been at the forefront of conversations about the legacy of transatlantic slavery uh, in Scotland. Um, what they, I think, each will try to do is encourage us to, to listen, to hear, to think, uh, about the ways that Scotland's connected global histories of imperialism and post-imperialism are, for many people, uh, embodied in the present. And whether or not that's if you're a member of a privileged or a disadvantaged group, member of a majority or, or a minoritized group, uh, because rather than necessarily being something which is entirely left uh, in the past, um, the legacy of uh, the transatlantic slave trade in Scotland is often something which is at the forefront uh, of a number of people's uh, experiences. Um, and so our speakers today are, include Dr. David Alston, who is a, a freelance um, author and historian and has worked as a, a youth worker, a school teacher, um, and been part, uh, indeed chair of an NHS board. Um, David has researched the role of Highland Scots in the, in the slave trade, um, for about 25 years, and his most recent publication is the highly recommended Slaves and Highlanders, Silence Histories of Scotland uh, and the Caribbean. Sheila Sante, to my right, is the project manager of Empire, Slavery and Scotland's Museums at Museums Galleries Scotland, not to be confused with National Museum of Scotland. She's previously worked uh, in a local authority, um, and uh, she has also worked at the Scottish um, portrait gallery, where she undertook a two-year fellowship on stories uh, of migration. Nelson Cummings is the Communities uh, and Campaigns Officer at the Coalition for Race, Equality and Rights uh, in Glasgow. Amongst his many activities is his role in coordinating the CRER's Black History Month uh, activities, which works closely with communities across Scotland. So David, can I perhaps um, ask you to, to get us going, really, with just offering a a brief sketch of, of what role Scotland played uh, in the plantation economies of the Caribbean and the Americas. I think a helpful way to start considering this is to remember that, the, that slavery was based on the belief that people could be owned, people could be property, and therefore people became commodities. Um, and there was a supply chain which began in Africa with, with the kidnapping and enslavement of people. People were then shipped in appalling conditions across the Atlantic, and, and that bit we often refer to as the transatlantic slave trade. After that, there, there was trade uh, organised by people called slave factors, which sold enslaved people on um, right to the, the, the smallest corner of corners of, of empire in, in the Caribbean and the Americas, and indeed beyond, because they also traded into to non-British colonies. And the whole purpose of that was then to exploit the labour of enslaved Africans and their descendants on, on slave plantations, producing cotton, coffee, sugar, and, and some other goods. And if we ask the question, well, how, how were Scots involved? They were involved in all parts of that trade. But the fact that very few slave ships sailed from Scotland historically allowed Scots to distance themselves. Um, 
right from the 19th century, people are, in Scotland are telling themselves the story that, that Scotland's hands are clean because we are not involved in the slave trade, meaning slave ships weren't sailing from Scotland. But in fact, almost exactly the opposite is true. Scots, in, in relation to the population of Scotland, Scots were disproportionately represented as captains of slave ships, surgeons on slave ships, slave factors in the Caribbean islands, and in the whole business of managing the plantations as, as owners, as managers, as overseers, as bookkeepers, with some parts of the, of the, of the colonies being more Scottish than others. So the, the, there are some places like Tobago, um, Guyana, which were, in, in, in relation, the proportion of the white population are, are, are particularly Scottish. Um, and of course, th there's the other effect that back home, there are key industries which are reliant on the plantation economies. So the main uh, export market for the Scottish linen industry was, a, was a, a material they called slave cloth because it was clothing for slaves. The Scottish herring industry was exporting salt herring as food for enslaved peoples. Um, and one way that I think is helpful to look at is if you ask the question, who was involved and who, who benefited? It's rather like asking the question, who's, who was involved and who benefited from North Sea oil? Now, of course, the, there are you know, some people made more money more than others out of North Sea oil, but its effects and the involvement permeated society. Could I ask you to maybe put some potential numbers on high points in the period of Scottish involvement in the slave trade. Is it true that at one point a third of all the slaves in Jamaica were owned by Scottish planters? Um, it seems um, th there is there's one source which suggests that a third of the white population of Jamaica had Scottish origins. Yeah. Um, that would be slightly different yeah. to, a, to, to, a, to a, a third of the enslaved population being owned. Um, but there, yes, there's, there, but what's particularly, um, even if it wasn't as high as a third, what's particularly dramatic about that is that that's kind of from a standing start because yeah. Jamaica was a, an English sugar island to which Scots didn't really have access until 1707. And that figure comes from the 1770s. So in, in half a century, Scots have moved from re, almost being excluded from the island to, to being as strongly represented as that. And that's... The, the, um, and in terms of proportions of the white population, that will be even more so in, in some of the Caribbean islands. I, I think we're probably reaching its highest level in Guyana on the north coast of South America. Um, and I mean, one measure we have of the involvement of, of Scots is in the compensation that was paid, not to the enslaved, but to slaveholders in 1834 at the end of colonial slavery. And, um, merchants in Glasgow re received more, co first of all, Scots proportionately received more compensation than, than, than English slaveholders, um, but also Glasgow slaveholders re received more in compensation for the, the enslaved people they held in Guyana than in Jamaica, despite the fact that Jamaica is a much larger colony. And what do you think, well, how would you rate the, the, the public knowledge of this? history that you've sketched out for us? Well, it's certainly got better. And, and, um, um, I mean, it is remarkable that 25 years ago, when the, the, the then new Museum of Scotland opened, it opened without a single merchant mention of slavery. Now, I, I don't believe that would happen now. Um, however, um, I think what does happen now is, is a lot of a lot of distancing from, from the reality of, of slavery and, and the Scottish involvement. And by that, I mean um, that a lot of people will say, well, it, yes, Scotland was involved, but it wasn't ordinary people like us. And that, that, I think that's quite a common way of expressing it, that it's, that it's the big merchants, it's people with big houses. And a lot of what I've been trying to do in my work is, is looking at the... the at the ordinary people who get involved. And I think it's part of the, the perniciousness and, and, and the tragedy of the whole system that it sucks people in who in their hearts knew better. And, and Robert Burns is the obvious example. I mean, he, he was going to go to work as an overseer on a slave plantation. He changed, he changed his mind for moral reasons. He, he changed his mind because the poetry started doing, doing better. So it sucked people in, people in like that. And they are ordinary people. They are people like us. And the disturbing thing, when you study this in detail, is how, how frighteningly easy it is to, 
to identify with the people and and to enter into their lives and to, and, and you do feel they, they are like us be, because they are and yet yet they are they are involved in the most appalling acts. Mm. Sheila, your your work in the um, Empire Slavery in Scotland's Museums project was perhaps the first in Scotland to try to gauge an understanding of both the, the grasp of Scotland's role in the slave trade, but also the contemporary uh, opinions of Scots to it. Um, I wonder if you might be able to run through some key, key points for us. Yeah, of course. Um, so, um, as you mentioned, um, I work for Museums Gallery Scotland, so we are the kind of advocacy policy grant funding body for all museums in Scotland. We don't hold any collections or anything, but we um, are there to support museums um, across Scotland, around 430 museums that are in Scotland. Um, and um, we were brought on board and as part of um, a project called Empire Slavery in Scotland's Museums that had its inception in um, June 2020. The um, Scottish Parliament voted um, in favour um, of a motion for a museum of slavery in Scotland. Um, and then um, that was broadened out, put into the Scottish programme for government um, as looking at across museums in Scotland and how they're addressing the legacies of historic slavery um, empire and colonialism um, within their spaces and also looking at um, the potential for um, a dedicated space to look um, at the, the roles of these legacies. Um, and so that um, was an independent steering group was set up to, to go into that. Um, and the independent steering group were um, asked to make recommendations to the Scottish Government. Um, and they made those recommendations um, in June this year. So um, those recommendations were given um, to the Scottish Government by the steering group. Um, and as part of that um, process, as you say, we wanted to consult really widely um, across a variety of um, people to really understand these legacies and what they mean for contemporary society. Um, and so we had three kind of different groups that we looked at. Um, we had um, a priority community group, as we um, termed that group, and that were those were people who whose lived experience of um, disc racial discrimination were a direct result of the legacies of um, historic slavery, colonialism, and empire. Um, we also um, worked with the museum sector itself and consulted with them, um, and also we had um, consultation with the wider Scottish mm -hmm. public. Um, and so th through that consultation, um, we were able to then come to the, the recommendations. But with the, the public element, um, what we had was um, a survey um, that went around um, to, the, to, to, to the Scottish public. Um, and in that, we had an overwhelming support for um, telling honest and accurate um, stories um, around, around, uh, regarding the, the legacies. Um, there was a, de a definite um, interest in learning more around the legacies of, and um, we separated them between historic slavery, um, empire and colonialism. Um, but we did find um, that when naming racism within the, specifically within the, um, the questions um, about looking at how these, ra these um, the legacies are race racism today, um, that then there was an understanding that kind of came down there and that understanding when actually naming racism and how that is a direct legacy of, 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 um, of these histories. So, um, but yeah, there was overwhelming support for doing this work um, and that was with the public. And then similarly with the, 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 um, the museum sector, there's overwhelming support to do the work, um, but really more of a, a desire for some support mm. and guidance around how to do it mm. um, and how to do it well. And also an understanding that it's another thing to be adding to what museum, the museum mm. sector is looking to do as well um, on stretch budgets mm. and just after a pandemic. But there was a desire to learn more and, yeah. and to, to tell those stories. Is it surprising, and it'd be interesting to know later from the audience whether or not it strikes him as surprising when, when you think about it, that there isn't a museum or a properly curated space in which you can tell the story of Scotland uh, and slavery already? Yeah, definitely. And it's, um, this, as this project, although um, the, the Motion Parliament was kind of the, the inception of the specific element of this project, there have been campaigns for years, and CRER um, have been part of um, one of the major campaigns to make to ensure these histories are put on the stage in museums and are told in museums, and particularly to have a dedicated space to that. Um, There's something that, that has been really important, and they've been campaigning for, and a lot of others have been campaigning for for years. But it has been quite quiet, and this is kind of this is the first time that it has 
been taken on um, in that way through a Scottish government sponsored um, program. Yeah. So yeah, it's surprising. <laughs> and and what, what are the next steps now from this? So, the, as I say, the recommendations um, are with um, Scottish Government and, they were, um, and the, the steering group that, um, gave those recommendations. Um, and then for Museums Gallery Scotland, we are there to support the sector um, to embed the area, different areas of the recommendations. So I can just give you a quick overview of the recommendations. There were six of them. The first one um, was for a dedicated space um, to address the, the legacies through um, development of a new organisation um, to... Um, and this new organisation should be run by people who have lived and professional experience of um, the historic legacies of um, slavery, um, empire and colonialism. Um, then recommendation two was looking at embedding anti-racism within the um, sector itself. Um, recommendation three was looking at how to, the sector can involve Scotland's people in development of projects and um, collections and programming in relation to the legacies. Um, recommendation four was particularly looking at the histories and how then really that the, 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 the Scotland's museums need to be looking and researching these histories. Five was how we can work with education um, and that was a huge part that came out across all three strands that, um, that this work isn't a standalone thing but this has to work in partnership with um, working with um, the education system and, and that has to be done together. Um, and then the last one was looking at the government making um, uh, statement um, in relation to repatriation and restitution of looted and stolen objects. So those are the six recommendations. Um, the recommendations that sit within what Museums Gallery Scotland kind of have the control of are two and two to four and um, looking at anti-racism within the sector, um, working with people within the sector um, more and also um, looking at in researching these histories within the sector. So we are now looking to support that and take that forward and see how we can help those who have expressed their desire to do this work, but as have also expressed their, their need for support. Yeah. I mean, Nelson, for, for a lot of people, it seems um, difficult to see a kind of a, uh, a direct relationship between slavery, its legacies, and, and contemporary racism. Um, how do you think the recognition of the kind of histories that both David and Sheila have outlined would go um, how do you think they could contribute to tackling contemporary experiences of racism in Scotland? Uh, thank you, Nasser. So I think a really key thing, and I think Sheila spoke about this as well, in seeing uh, contemporary racism as a legacy of transatlantic slavery and sort of wider forces of like colonialism and empire as well, is that the fact, I think, you know it's important to not define um, the sort of histories of black people, minority ethnic people through these lenses. I think a lot of the time in Scotland's relationship to black people, to people from a minority ethnic background, um, a lot of that relationship has sadly been defined by slavery, by colonialism, by empire, and that's had a deep impact historically on how um, Scottish society has perceived those communities and viewed those communities. You know, like slavery itself was maintained by a sort of codified a racialized system that meant it was explicitly reserved you know, for people uh, who are black African or black African heritage. And I think that shows us that that sort of force of white supremacy of racism has really played a key role in Scottish society historically. And that has continued to maintain and sort of led us to having contemporary racism. I think a good example of where we see that is actually in the uh, compensation scheme that came in at the end of the slavery trade and David mentioned it as well but the fact that that scheme uh, compensated uh, enslavers not people who were enslaved sort of shows us who was prioritized in the uh, opinion that was held of people who were enslaved that even this act of abolition that is quite often defined as being something that was uh, overwhelmingly positive which you no know, it was a positive thing but it also uh, it was done in a way that was still actually quite racist and marginalised people who were enslaved by not uh, giving them compensation. It wasn't necessarily an action that was taken um, by people who were explicitly anti-racist. You know, like the sort of abolitionist movement itself, it can be a point of contention, particularly, um, among, particularly in the sort of viewpoints of white abolitionists. And I think that legacy has sort of filtered down over time and led us to having issues of contemporary racism today. Um, so like for example, in Scotland today, uh, almost half of 
children who live in poverty are from minority ethnic families. Um, the poverty rate experienced by minority ethnic people is more than double that of white Scottish people. I think in a lot of the ways we think about poverty and um, think about the sort of stereotype that we quite often think of when we think of people who are working class, people who might live in poverty, we quite often think of those people as being white and actually don't think enough about the experiences of minority ethnic people. And I think a lot of that is a legacy from um, the sort of histories of slavery and empire that Scotland's been complicit in as well. Um, the, other, like, the final thing I would say about that as well, you see that in who was sort of complicit in the slavery trade as well. So in Glasgow, where we do a lot of work, a lot of um, very influential members of Glaswegian society in the 17th, 18th, 19th century were enslavers. You know, you see that in the uh, there's excellent work that's been done by uh, Dr. Stephen Mullen into this that shows that about 40 out of the 79 people who were Lord Provost in the city of Glasgow between 1636 and 1834 had some connection to slavery. So some of them were enslavers, some of them invested in slavery, and um, some of them you know, had a connection, whether direct or indirect, to that trade. And these were people at the very top of Glaswegian society, uh, very influential people. I think that shows us that uh, during times of the slavery trade, um, Glaswegian society, Scottish society was institutionally racist and these people had a massive influence. And I think, I don't think there's been a sort of real anti-racist action or overturning of that structure that's happened in that time since where we can really say that we're an anti-racist society today. And I think that's where that legacy of contemporary racism comes from in Scottish society as well. Yeah, thank you. Just whilst I prime the audience to get their questions ready, uh, one, one for the entire panel, really, which is that um, it seems like one of the, the flashpoints in discussing the legacy of uh, transatlantic slave, tra uh, of transatlantic slave trade and, and slavery more broadly in Scotland's connection to it um, isn't so much the genealogy and, and the labour and the archival work which is being done and, and needs to be done, um, but it's more about what we do as rememberers with that, um, insofar as the contentions over public commemorations of historic slavers and how we uh, turn to that presently. Um, do either of you want to speak to that, specifically that charge that sometimes we judge society or judge the past from today's standards? So. I, I, I don't think we are. Uh, yes, and that's, a, that's a common line. We, we shouldn't judge the past by, by today's standards. but. The, the people at the time, in many ways, had the same standards. They were living in the world of the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, and one of, I mean, what, one of the first Africans to write an account of being enslaved and, and is Caguano, and he was enslaved by, by a Scot. Um, and, and he's very clear that everyone in Britain, some more than others, are responsible for the evil of, of slavery. That's what he, he's, he's aware of it writing in the 18th century. So I, th I think, I think pe people in many ways did have the same standard, but what is, what is happening is a, com a complicity, as, as Nelson said, and uh, it's sometimes quite difficult to find the right language. It's, it's, not, it, it's a turning away, it's a blindness, it's a, an unwillingness to attend to the, the humanity of the enslaved. Um, and, and you, you see this again and again in, in, in the letters that, that mm. are written from the Caribbean. There's, there's lots of, of humanity when it comes to their, their friends and their relations uh, and an and, and obliviousness to the reality of the lives of those who are enslaved. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, and also I think that's, um, for me, I think it's really important to, to understand that although um, the effects of um, these legacies hit um, black people and people um, who are minority ethnic um, in a first, it, they are legacies for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, we all live with those legacies. They still um, permeate the structures that we live with and they still keep us um, from having a more cohesive society and for us being able to recognise that we are all um, really of the same race. Um, and so I think that, you know, although 
often these stories are told in, a, in another way in that, you know, that we're doing this for, um, for people who are black or minority ethnic. It's actually for the whole society mm. to really be able to reckon with and understand its history, to be able to then move forward and hopefully learn from it. That's really how I would say yeah. Um, no, I was just I was, um, thinking when you were chatting, speaking then, Sheila, actually about um, this, that when we're talking about racism as a structural force, um, we sort of see it as, you know, like, not, there are very, or I think CRER would argue that there are very few people who are individually racist. There are some, but there are very few, and actually it's more that in a society um, that allows racism to exist, you get a lot of people who will do racist things. I was thinking that when we, that argument comes forward about um, there were different standards. As you were saying, David, I think actually a lot of people, when they had an opportunity to be educated about the reality of slavery, the reality of the cruelty behind it, um, the abolition movement then had great support. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone who supported it wasn't, uh, didn't necessarily do other racist things or didn't view uh, black people as equal or anything like that, but they clearly, you know, when the cruelty of the slavery trade was highlighted, uh, people came out against it in significant numbers. And I think that alone shows us that, uh, you know, that sort of treatment of people and that cruelty and uh, human suffering and misery wasn't acceptable. It's just when racism operates on an institutional and structural level, it can be quite hard to counter um, racism when it exists on that scale, because as David was listing um, the sort of facts and figures behind how far the slavery trade reached and the significance of it, it was clearly really key and really underpinned a lot of how Scottish and British society operated, and that's a really hard thing to counter against, and I think especially for the individual person. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nasser. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, David. Well, I think you've got us started and given us a basis on which to have uh, a rich discussion. So um, there are some roving mics uh, in the room. So if you can indicate if you would like to ask a question, um, you would be very much encouraged to do so. Those of you on, on social media, don't forget our hashtag, which I should have told you at the beginning, should you wish to tweet. It is uh, uh, hashtag uh, FOP2022. You can join in. Uh, digitally, if you don't ask a question in the room. Um, bear in mind, please, that uh, there's quite a few of you, so if you want to raise a question, uh, don't take, don't take uh, all, all our time. So please, I think we have three people here. Uh, the, the person just in the front, uh, in, the, in the red, uh, and then the person behind in blue was next, I think. Um, my question is mainly for Sheila. What would be the advantage of a Scottish slavery museum as opposed to putting a slavery exhibit in all the currently existing museums since slavery permeated every part of society? Thank you. Um, that's a really good question. Um, it's one that our project um, wrestled with and thought, talked about a lot. Um, and I think the answer is they're not mutually exclusive. Um, and so for a lot of the work that Museums Gallery Scotland do, it's for um, including these histories across all museums and for, for, and for an understanding, as um, David mentions, the, the, you know, that often people think maybe about the central belt, but these, you know, these are, these are permeate all of Scottish society and all places have a connection to it. So yeah, really understanding that and being really clear about that is really, really important to, to all of this work. Um, but the, a dedicated space has a lot of, has the potential, it's, we don't know what that is at the moment, and it's not for me to decide, it's, it would be for a new organisation to decide, but has the potential to be a place potentially of um, remembrance, of um, reparation, a place of, that's, that's specifically for and told by those who are affected by the legacy. Okay. Um, we have the person the second, third row in, in the room. This time frame in which transatlantic slavery took place also was the time when many Scots were um, cleared off their land and uh, the, the, or press ganged. Uh, so there was that sort of racism, which is this is perhaps a subject of a topic for another <laughs> festival. But um, yeah, it's still the legacy still exists today yeah. Uh, yeah. amongst the colonial. Countries. <laughs> and it's, it is your point that um, precisely at the moment Scotland enters the transatlantic slave trade, it's a reflection of the clearances and people being forced into 
that labour. David, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, I think it's like, you, in many ways, I think racism grows towards the end of slavery. Um, I mean, clearly the whole system had a, a racial basis, but I, I, th I think with abolition, um, in, in some ways racism becomes more important to a lot of people because once slavery is gone, th that idea of a hierarchy of races and a and, and mission to, to civilise the, the lesser races becomes, becomes, I think, comes to the fore in society. And, and I think that has an impact on, on Scotland and on the Highlands because you also get views about, you know, whether, you know, about Saxon peoples and Celtic peoples. Um, and, and I think some of the worst, I think it's legitimate to say it's racist, some of the worst racist attitudes towards Gales come, come later in the 19th century rather than in the, the period of the clearances, which seems to be more driven by by economics and profit, and, and not by a racist ideology. So it's, there, there's, there's, there's complicated things about the, the timescales here. Please, uh, the gentleman back. Uh, <coughs> hello. As Sheila, um, thank you all, but as Sheila mentioned reparations, and, and I wanted to uh, ask for views on that, and if, if I might say something briefly uh, of my own, my own view. I, I, I am descended from uh, uh, a family that owned plantations and enslaved people, perhaps 900 people in Jamaica and Tobago, uh, Scottish family, uh, and I live here in Edinburgh. Uh, and I've done my best when I realised this to educate myself about it. And I've been to Jamaica and Tobago and talked to people there who lived on those plantations, uh, the descendants of those who lived on those plantations about what they feel what we, what they ask us, people like me, to do today. And, and, I, and there are things that people like me, descendants, the privileged people who may not, perhaps not wealthy any longer, but still privileged because of the wealth, uh, you can do. But one of the things that really interests me is the uh, failure of the UK government to respond in any way to the CARICOM nation's call for discussions about reparative justice first made in 2014. And we've completely ignored this. Uh, we haven't even had the grace to respond to the letter, unlike some other European nations who, where discussions are going further ahead. Um, Scotland, um, I'm proud, as a proud Scot, I'm proud that Scotland has a, now has a foreign aid budget. We give it to Zambia, Malawi, Pakistan. But Guyana, which has already been mentioned, full of Scots, fortunes made in, by Scots, including the Gladstone family of Leith, um, is poorer than any of those three nations. When are we going to start talking here, if London refuses to, to the Caribbean nations about what, and the West African nations, about what we owe them, and how we can help them, and how we can be better friends with them, and try and bring some peace and reconciliation to this whole story? Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and for that provocation. Do either of you want to pick up? She probably knows more about this than me. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that as well. I think, I think to be honest on this issue of reparations, um, it's, it's something that I think for us to progress forward to being an anti-racist society has to happen, because as we've sort of spoken about on this panel, you know, the racism of today is rooted in that racism of the past, and we have to acknowledge that, and we have to acknowledge where racism's come from in taking these reparative actions, because it's not just this acknowledgement of where it's come from, but it's also this acknowledgement of the harm that it's caused, and the harm that these legacies still cause to minority ethnic people uh, in the present day as well. So I think at the very core, reparative justice and anti-racist actions actually go hand in hand in that and in acknowledging, um, you know, acknowledging something's bad has happened and has caused a lot of harm, so that still has to happen. Um, sorry, so something has to be done to rectify that in the present day. Um, but I also think with reparations, as we sort of spoke to at the start, what really uh, irritates me, even though it happened centuries ago, is that actually, you know, like reparations were paid. They were paid to enslavers. And um, to me, that shows uh, actually the sort of institutional racism that was present 
in the UK government at that time that their priority or who they saw as um, suffering the most harm from the end of slavery and who had to be protected. What it wasn't about, you know, supporting the communities that had been slaved and cruelly treated for hundreds of years. It was about supporting the people who had uh, made profits off that cruelty. And I think that is a big historical imbalance that actually any reparative action has to address because we still have those imbal great imbalances of wealth um, in Scottish and in British society today. Um, and yeah, I think with any reparative action, it would be a very um, challenging thing to do because we're talking about a big um, change in the way our society works and the way our society is structured. But I think we have to acknowledge the challenge of that. But we also have to acknowledge it as an action that we should be wanting to do because of the history that our nation is complicit in. It's that acknowledgement of we've done something terrible to communities of people over hundreds of years. So we have to do something to start to acknowledge that and also to rectify it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Shiva, did you want um, yeah, I mean, those, yeah, I, I can't unfortunately speak to what the government will do. Um, but um, with um, some of the discussions I've, we've had um, across um, the museum sector about how how can we be part of reparative justice, and there's some really interesting discussions um, about how we can be there to help with a lot of the work. And I know David's really interested in a lot of the work in you know in Guyana and preserving records and understanding um, across the the um, these the, the, these variety of places across the, the globe that we, we are connected with in us helping and finding out what they need from us in helping to preserve records, helping to tell stories. Um, and so th that's an element where we have, we can, we can be part of helping to um, repair um, some things. Um, and, and, and it's very important, I, th I think, to, to be always asking what it is that others need rather than trying to guess or give people things that they don't want or need. So, um, yeah, finding out what these places need and, find, and trying to find a way for us to actually give back um, and what it is that we can do in that. And so it, that's a new discussion. A lot of our discussions um, were within Scotland. It was an 18-month project and we didn't really have the capacity to go internationally. But moving forward, I think it's really important that we start to look at how what we do is, is, is connected directly to a lot of these places across the globe. David, I know you. Yeah, I mean, Alex Renton has very eloquently ex expressed the issue and the urgency of, of, of the issue. And there is no reason why whatever the UK government is doing, Scotland can't be engaged. And this is not just a comment about Scottish government, it's about Scottish political parties, because I don't think there was anything in any of the political parties' manifestos at the last election that referred to, to reparations, and th there should be. Um, I think there are things that we can do at individual level, at community level, and at, at national level, whether that's Scottish or UK level. CARICOM is, the, the Cari is, is an organisation, the Caribbean community, which has a TED point plan for reparation. The very least we could do is start engaging in discussion about that TED point plan. And the, 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 you know, the, the, there, are, there, are, there have been contacts between leading academics in the Caribbean and Scottish government offering to discuss these matters, and, and none of them that I know of have been, have been picked up. Uh, could I just say something about compensation? Yes. Because I, um, I, the, the compensation payments that were made in 1834, I think something, something that's often missed is this. Compensation was based on the assessed value of enslaved people, which they did by looking at how much they had sold for over a 10-year period. And then slaveholders were given compensation of about half of that amount. And where, where was the rest of the of the value to come from? It came from the un, it was to come from the unpaid labour of the formerly enslaved period people for for six. It was intended to be six years. It actually ended up being four. So, in slave, not only was the compensation paid to the slaveholders, but the formerly enslaved people were expected to meet a very substantial cost of their own emancipation. Which involved remaining effectively indentured. Yeah, they, they, they became indentured, um, Except yes. their title to change, they were called apprentices. Okay, yes, 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 rather. But, I mean, your point, Nelson's point, Sheila's intervention in, re in response to, to the provocation from, from uh, the questioner, um, emphasised um, reparations and mentioned uh, Gladstone, of course. And 
I suppose one of the remarkable things about those compensation payments to slaveholders was the way in which that wealth was obviously generative. It quickly um, divested and was reinvested into things like the railways or indeed into historic buildings and uh, the legacies of which you know, are, are amongst us in our built environment today. But even that understanding, it seems, we're, we're some distance from uh, a broad public concept of those things. Many people would imagine that when slavery ended, so did its proceeds. Um, so this goes back to that question at the beginning in terms of, you know, what beyond a promise for education um, needs to be done to, just at an elementary level, whatever your moral position on, on these things, just establish a sufficient understanding of what the history of this country is. Uh, a small question. Um, a small question. <laughs> which you're not compelled to answer. If there's any more from the audience, please, this gentleman in the black t shirt. Hi, I'm Scott Bridges. I'm from Alabama, which has a uh, remarkable history. In 1831, they passed a law that made even the discussion or distribution of abolitionist literature punishable by death. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, Andrea Baker is going to be singing about this topic uh, at the Piano Dome uh, this week, uh, and, and I mean next week and the week after. Uh, it's a remarkable uh, situation. I hope you all go to it. Um, my question is, in the States, uh, it has been addressed at one level uh, by a concept called affirmative action. Uh, and that has not yet achieved what it, it hoped to achieve, and it's largely been put on the shelf. Reparations is a new concept, but I think reparations has to do with uh, the idea that reconciliation means balancing the checkbook, if you will. Uh, but I would like to ask the panel, uh, is reparation a form of uh, affirmative action? Uh, and if so, how will you improve what the states uh, haven't been able to uh, uh, do themselves? Well, well, thank you for your question, but also thank you for coming all the way from Alabama for our panel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're very grateful for your, for your participation. Um, do you want to have... I yeah, can, yeah, sure. um, no, thank you. And I would echo that about um, going to see Andrea Baker. She's absolutely fantastic. So, um, but um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so CRER is a sort of anti-racist uh, organisation and charity. Uh, part of our sort of goal is to build the social, economic and political capital of minority ethnic people living in Scotland. So I think that sort of action would if successful, would sort of feed into some of the points you're raising about how we um, sort of build up um, minority ethnic communities and seek to address historical and contemporary imbalances in wealth and in influence in Scottish society. Um, but I think it's like a great question to think about how we do it, because I think a lot of the time when we, in the UK, and particularly in Scotland, when we sometimes talk about actions that could be uh, similar to actions of affirmative action in the US, um, it can be met with a bit of a sort of reaction that sees it as being something that might be like going too far or too radical and things like that. I think that shows us there's a long way to go in how we see racism and how we see racism should be, how we think racism should be addressed. Because I think actions like that, that are very active, actively anti-racist and take you know, like big steps to addressing imbalances in social, economic, and political capital in society. I think they're the actions that we need. Um, but I think in Scotland, I don't know what the panelists would think, but I think we're quite actually far off having the conversations about how we take those actions. I know there are individual examples on a local level. So for example, there's been work done in Glasgow to try and address the lack of black or minority ethnic uh, teachers in Glasgow schools. and. That's not to say that this uh, action is in any way complete or is even like halfway through its journey because there's still very few uh, teachers from that background in Glasgow schools. But I think a lot of the action that has been tried to take into address things like this has been quite local. I think there's still a real need for national action. And I think it feels like the conversation is still to happen, sadly. I don't know what panel 
everyone else would think, but I think that shows we're quite a way off getting to that stage of taking that action and figuring out how we can take that action in a way that is actually successful and effective as well. I would agree with Nelson. I mean, the first step is we need to be in conversation, and we need to be in conversation and hearing voices from beyond our own, beyond our boundaries, because the majority of people who live with the legacies of British colonial slavery are not here. They're, they're, they're in the Caribbean and elsewhere. So that, that, that conversation, because I, I don't know the answers, and, and none of us, I think, will really know the answers until, until we are engaged. I, I think there's also a, um, a sort of um, a, an issue for, his, for historians and for our institutions, because the histories of what remains of them, of, of millions of people, are held in documents that are, that are here. And I, I think there has to be some kind of priority given to, to making these records available so that individuals who are living with, with the legacy of colonial slavery also have access to, 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 the, to the ability to, to study that history, whether that's family history or, it, or it's looking in, 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 in greater depth at, at, at the, the analysis, the, the detail of what was going on. I mean, both your answers are really interesting because if I've discerned them, you, you actually have quite different ideas of reparatory justice. I mean, um, Nelson, you were talking about the contemporary implications of historic racism mm -hmm. as manifest in the life chances of, of racialized, minoritized people in Scotland today, including in labor market participation, including in education. And, and you're talking about a global reparatory uh, recourse, both in terms of knowledge and access to data, but also the kind of, um, the kind of um, investment or reinvestment, I suppose, that the questioner was also leaning towards. They're, they're not exclusive. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, I, I, I mean, I, um, I, I, think we, I think we need to be hear, hearing, we need to be hearing both vo voices from within Scotland that, that are unheld, but we also need to hear the voices from yeah. beyond our boundaries. Yeah. I wonder if that actually sort of shows how much work there is to be done, because I would completely agree with what David was mm. saying about reaching um, the sort of work to be done, uh, particularly in the places that are former colonies as well. So I wonder if that just shows how wide a reaching issue it is and how much work there is to be done as well. I mean, in the city... Did you want to come in? No, no, no. no, no, no. I mean, in the city, of course, we, we did hear lots of voices, and most recently over the renaming or the addition to the Melvin Monument, the Henry Dundas statue, um, where there were a few words added to the plaque to say, and I quote, he was, a, he was instrumental in deferring the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade. Now, there was quite a, quite a significant um, uh, movement to resist that, to object to it, and to retain the you know, insignia that was there in the first instance. And, and I wondered if any of you wanted to comment on what that reaction might tell us about where we are as a society in terms of wanting to even have that conversation. Nobody was saying, tear it down. Uh, nobody had the grappling ropes in the van. You know, it was, um, it, was, it was simply a statement of fact to be added to the plaque, and it was resisted with, with quite a degree of force, legal and political. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it's perhaps a warning that we're maybe not as far along this journey as we sometimes think we are and like to claim we are. It is, as you say, it was the adding of some words. Now, you, you, you could argue about the words and whether some other words might, might have been better, but I don't think that's really what the dispute was about. Um, the dispute seemed to be about doing something. Yeah. Um, and that's... And unsettling uh, an accepted narrative. Yes, it is, yeah. And, but interesting, I mean, Gla um, I don't know if it's a Glasgow-Edinburgh thing, but um, Edinburgh seems to tie itself in knots over these. <laughs> Glasgow seems to get on with it and, and you know, but, but has, has done a lot. Um, 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 yeah, I, I think, I don't know. Like, you like to speak on behalf of all of Glasgow? No, I like to speak on behalf of Glasgow. <laughs> or the council. Uh, I, I just think if there is a Glasgow region here with my accent, they might have a bit. <laughs> um, no, I think it's a good point, because I think actually a lot of the time um, we quite often get caught up in debates about things like statues and monuments that actually like aren't necessarily too significant to the overall understanding of that history. Um, so in Glasgow, there's been lots of work done by lots of very talented individuals um, to you know, put together um, sort of comprehensive guides to that history in Glasgow. There are like walking tours that CRER run, 
There's an excellent book called It Was New Us by um, Dr. Stephen Mullen that outlines this history in Glasgow. And I think, I don't know, I feel like a lot of the hostility towards adding something like that to the Dundas uh, monument, the Melville monument, sorry. Um, I think that actually shows us that a lot of the time, the way we're taught about history is we're taught it as though there's like good and bad, and we're not actually taught about the complexities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, if we're taught in school at all about the British Empire, uh, like when I was at school, I don't think I was taught about the British Empire at all, to be honest. But if anyone is taught about it, they're quite often taught about it as being a good thing um, and solely a good thing. And I think that means that if there's anything bad that's put forward about it, it gets met with hostility because it's challenging the way that you've been taught and it's challenging a lot of the narratives that you've sort of come to internalise about Britain and Scotland's place in the world. I think that's where the hostility comes. I think that's why a lot of the work in Glasgow that's been done by CRER and other organisations and other individuals is very much focused on education, whether that's adult education or education with young people and actually giving people the sort of facts and his and the history behind their city and then letting them, you know, choose what they want to do with it, choose how to interpret it, choose to, you know, choose what to do with where they live. Like we I've had the pleasure of um being involved in running our walking tours for about eighteen months now. And it's actually quite striking how many people come up to you after it and sort of be very grateful um mm. to learn more about where they live. And this is people who've lived in the city for, you know, their whole <laughs> lives and they they didn't know, for example, um the Gallery of Modern Art in Glasgow, part of that used to, you know, very significant in the city centre, uh, part of that used to be an enslaver's mansion. And there'll be people who've walked past that every day of their lives and didn't know that. And I think actually that's where the sort of approach is to educating people on the wider history is powerful. Um, mm -hmm. But when it can become fixated on a statue or a street name, I think that can be quite easy for people to be hostile to because it's mm. like one fixed place as well and when actually you educate people on the wider history mm. I know it's the same the similar histories in Edinburgh mm. you educate people on the wider history and they realize it covers like the whole city uh, it can be quite hard to escape them well I mean not to carry on the Glasgow Edinburgh dynamic but I'll beat your uh, Museum of Modern Art and offer you Butte House which is the official residence <laughs> of the first minister <laughs> is a uh, constructor from slave money and we also have our own Edinburgh, Slavery, and uh, 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 Imperial Tour by Lisa Williams yeah, uh, from the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Caribbean Society. So we're, we're, I think we're, we're uh, even, even there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, did you? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I would say is um, I think a lot of the time, yeah, a lot these kind of discussions can get hijacked by the one particular person, one particular monument. Um, and actually when, and often I think sometimes these discussions are heightened by a rhetoric, but actually maybe not what people think on the ground. Um, and especially, as I say, we surveyed around 5,000 people asking about the legacies, and the majority of people were in favour of looking at these subjects and talking about these subjects and, and having an honest and accurate portrayal of them. And so I think maybe there's often a skewing maybe in the media and the way that things are actually told that, that push the, 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 you know, a negative us and them, you know, two sides of, of, a, of a culture war. But actually, when you're talking to people on the ground, and as you say, when you're taking them around a, a, on a tour, it's, it's just really expanding their understanding of history and their understanding of Scotland's role in the world. Um, and that they isn't really the case for most people, I think, on the ground. I think it's, 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 it's often um, being portrayed in a way um, and then it's kind of hijacked by certain people. Yeah. Do we have any more questions, please, from the audience? Thank you. It's kind of not really a question. I'm actually from Scotland's International Development Alliance, and we're very interested in this for, to challenge you to go even further, that the legacies of all of this are about current global inequalities, mm -hmm. actually. And when the First Minister stands up at COP26 and, you know, to be fair, shows some leadership in committing to financing loss and damage and talks about climate reparations, those reparations are also part of the legacy of the slavery, of slavery, frankly, as well as colonialization. So I think the challenge is even bigger than you said. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Should we take that as a comment, unless any of you, anyone pick it up? 
Um, I mean, the thing I would say just quickly is, yeah, climate um, is all wrapped up in this, and there's a lot of work to be done to understand the, the, the intersections there, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good point. There's a lot of work to yeah. do. <laughs> um, was there a hand? Yes, a gentleman just on the third row. Just going back to this question of education, you mentioned education several times, and it, I have learned quite a bit, I mean, very, only very recently about this, but I've also learned very recently about a lot of the bad things that we did in the empire, in India, in the Middle East, all over the place. And is the attempt to teach about this being done as part of the teaching of empire, the good and the bad? Thank you. Did you want to? Um, I, I don't know enough about what's happening in education to, to, to say what's being done, but I think it is very important that we don't have a narrative that says there was slavery, then there was abolition, and everything was fine after that, um, because that's, a, that's a, a, a gross distortion. And I think understanding the, the impact of slavery involves thinking about what happened afterwards, which was in part, we included the turn to indentured Indian labourer, to labour to, to replace enslaved labour. Um, and that's another huge movement of people across the globe. Um, Can you do, just summarise that briefly? So lots of people what maybe don't know about them. Yeah, um, people were still making money out of slave plantations at the end of colonial slavery. Um, and then there was this period of then of, of forced unpaid la labour of four years. Uh, and not surprisingly after that, a great number of formerly enslaved people did not want to work on plantations, or certainly didn't want to work full time. Uh, they, they, they wanted their own land, they, they wanted to become smallholders, um, they wanted to become crofters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there was, so where people were still making money, there was a shortage of labour, with an experiment, first of all, in Guyana, they brought over indentured labourers from India. Um, so now in Guyana, the descendants of indentured Indian labourers are the majority population. Um, it, and the same will be true of Trinidad, to a lesser extent, of, of, of other islands. But the, the, I mean, it's a good example of, of the, the continuing problems, because what happened right up until the 50s and the 60s is that Britain and the US encouraged racialized politics because they felt that that was that would had a stronger chance of getting them governments that they thought would be sympathetic to the west uh, rather than to the soviet bloc so britain stepped in and removed the elected government of guyana in the early 1950s um, after independence there was dreadful intercommunal violence that had been been fueled by by that intervention in the racialized politics, and there was a slight upsurge of that only two years ago at, at, at again, disputed, disputed elections. So yeah. people, I mean, people right down to today in Guyana are living with a legacy that you can trace from slavery, but continuing through a whole process of, of, of colonial administration. Yeah. And in terms of the connection to the wider British imperial mm. project and including Scotland's role within that, um, a grasp of which helps us to understand where people who were, um, who were deported from, uh, from Kenya and from Uganda, wh why they were there. They were taken from India by the British to, to work uh, in those industries. Uh, and they were never, uh, they were never um, uh, really seen as, uh, as Kenyan or Ugandan um, because in many respects they were a new overseer for the British. Uh, they were the middlemen, uh, middlewomen uh, who operated uh, the bureaucracies of those sectors. Um, Nathan, did you want to? No? No? I mean, but, but the question which goes back to the earlier point about um, um, education and a, a compartmentalised view of the role of Britain, <coughs> empire, slavery um, in making the modern world. Um, your analogy was North Sea Oil, where really what matters less is necessarily the um, Lord Melville's, and more indeed what that um, helped to create and sustain in a way in which affected everybody. Everybody was a consumer of sugar, everybody 
was um, affected by the cotton. You know, I'm from the north of England. The, the Manchester cotton mills wouldn't have been um, wouldn't have been um, um, plausible were it not for the for the cotton that was laboured in in in, this, in the colonies in the in the south of uh, of what today is the USA. Um, these are deeply connected histories mm. of which it seems that. Um, we, we struggle even to have a partial account of at times, um, let alone try to grasp their contemporary, contemporary resonance. Have things changed since Black Lives Matter became the movement that it was? Has it helped to uplift what ought to be um, um, a, a, an opportunity for shared, for an understanding of shared histories? I mean, on the education point, just to um, come back, I do know that there is work going on, and I think Sierra, you're a part of that work, um, within um, the government to look at the curriculum and changes to that. It's, what, what will come out of that is still to be decided, but there, there, is, um, there is work being done, and we, as part of the, our project as well, we're in a lot of conversations about how we can um, ensure that we kind of make, have that joined effort to... To, to do this work together, so there is there mm. is work happening within the education system, and hopefully that will actually bear fruit and have something really exciting at the end of that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was also to talk about as well. When we think about education, obviously schools absolutely essential, um, as you mentioned. But I was thinking about um, one of the questions actually that came from the front there about making sure that this history is spoken to. Uh, in every museum and not just in a potential museum of empire, slavery, colonialism, migration, and like how important that is um, in terms of our education, uh, as important as schools are, it happens in a range of places and that's why I think heritage and culture are so key and I think that's why actually having hopefully a museum of empire and slavery but also embedding the teaching of that history into lots of different spaces is really key as well. Like in the sort of... Um, current coordination of our program for Black History Month in October. There are um, sort of like walking tours, exhibitions being put forward by heritage organisations sort of across Scotland about that area's specific ties to slavery or empire. And I think that shows us how um, sort of deep that connection went across Scotland, but also that there are lots of different spaces in which people can learn these histories as well, as essential as schools are. I think particularly thinking about adult education, there are also lots of spaces where mm. this history can be learned if it wasn't taught at schools, and I think that's why um, this sort of work within the museum sector is so important as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, please, David, and then the question. Uh, the, the I mean, as well as the impact of Black Lives Matter, I think something else that is having quite a big impact is, is, is lockdown and, and Zoom. Yeah. That mm. Suddenly there's the opportunity to be part of discussions that, that are in my experience, much wider than, than they were before. Um, I took part in a conference a couple of weeks ago in St Vincent. Mm. Um, I, I just wouldn't have had that opportunity. And it's not that I'm taking part of matters, but that I'm hearing mm. um, the voices of, of students and, and teachers in St Vincent yeah. and, and getting something of their perspective yeah. on, on what matters in, yeah. in this history. Um, and I, I find that... I, I found that transforming, challenging, um, and it, it, it's really made me think about some of, some of the way I phrase things, some of the things I, I've thought before. Thank you. There's a question here just on the third row. And then was that your hand up at the back? Then you could be our last you question. Go. Oh, you go. <laughs> You're very welcome. I, I'd like very much to expand Black Lives Matter to be Black Lives Matter, Brown Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. And I'm thinking of the British Empire in India, Pakistan, and particularly in the Middle East, and the utter humiliation that we made on people there. And I'm thinking perhaps particularly of the Palestinian people who've really been broken and their land has been lost. The least we could do would be to recognize Palestinian people, recognize the land. Thank you. And I, I guess the challenge is in drawing attention and emphasis to um, undervalued black lives, not to place it within a sense of, not competition, but um, tension with, with other forms of historic injustice. So th there, there is a movement to recognize Palestinian lives matter, and it's something which, which may be mutually 
connected to those imperial histories, but they also have distinct genealogies too. Um, but even your question speaks to the frustration in terms of an ignorance of understanding where that state emerged from in what context and what our relationship to it was. Um, that point is very much taken. Please go ahead. Can I? Yeah. <coughs> sorry, uh, sorry to, to uh, intervene again. I, I wanted to make two very brief points. Uh, uh, firstly, about Edinburgh and Edinburgh's reassessment of this history, and I'd, I'd live in Leith myself. Uh, let's not forget the Edinburgh Council led um, committee sitting under Sir Jeff Palmer, one of the heroes of educating people like me about Scotland's connection to slavery, which is still due to report here and is still subject to political attack and needs support. Um, so I saw Sir Jeff three days ago doing an event in, in East Lothian. He, he's tireless about getting around the country I mean, and, and asking Scots to wake up and see why this is relevant today. Um, the other point is, is I think we can be a little complacent about denialism of slavery and the racism and inequality that toxifies this country and others today, which come directly from it, and, and, and complacent about the forces against whom we're fighting. I mean, it's perfectly true that you know, the, the, Scot the time Scotland and a few red-trousered people in the new town made a very big noise about the Dundas statue, and, and it was foolish, and, and, it, and we as a city have got over it. But if you go to Waterstones today, the, the history book on the front table for tourists to, to buy, Michael Fry's recently republished History of Edinburgh, 500 pages, contains no mention of the word slavery whatsoever. Mm. So there's an academic establishment, there's a political establishment that not just wants to tell people to shut up about this, but also keep faith with the version, the white supremacist version of history that I was taught at school. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that's bringing us towards the end of the Q&A. Um, but it gives us an opportunity for a final few comments for each of our panellists. So I started, David, with you. Maybe I should start, Nelson, with you. Yeah, sure. Um, I was actually, yeah, when you were talking about that, I was thinking, this is why, to me, reparative justice needs to be at the heart of anything we do around this. Because I think, actually, you talk about that history of Edinburgh, and there have been similar histories of Glasgow, histories of Scotland written. I think sometimes it's actually this lack of acknowledgement that in the past, in our you know, work as potentially historians, our work um, in whatever field we might be, whether it's education, heritage, um, it's actually acknowledging that in the past sometimes we've got it wrong, and then that can help mm. you to um, you know, acknowledge that actually these histories did happen. It can help to, like, I think, counter some of the hostility and denialism by actually um, rooting ideas of reparation at the heart of what you do to acknowledge you've got something wrong in the past and to acknowledge that um, you can sort of do better in the future. Um, but the sort of, I guess the final point I would make, I think one thing that's become clear throughout this conversation is that as important as it is to discuss and acknowledge the legacies and impacts of um, transatlantic slavery on modern day Scottish society, um, that we can't actually do that without acknowledging the wider um, impact of empire as well. It sort of so underpins everything else and lets us have these wider conversations about um, you know, British atrocities committed in places like India, um, in places like Myanmar and things like that. Um, I think it's just so key to any of this work that uh, that understanding of empire is there. Because I think that's how we also have sort of solidarity between different communities as well. Mm. So a lot of the time in our approach to uh, Black History Month at CRER and Black History in general, we take an approach that looks to build that sort of multi-ethnic solidarity. And part of that is rooted in that idea that a lot of people from minority ethnic backgrounds living in Scotland have a shared experience of empire or colonialism or migration mm -hmm. and I think that's really key I think the next sort of step for a lot of this work is to start to look at uh, the wider ties to empire it's like even in Glasgow even though there's been a lot of work done on Glasgow's ties to slavery and to the slavery trade actually that work looking at our ties to empire 
is still to be done and mm. still needs to be done as well. I think that's the sort of next step in building our understanding of our sort of history as a nation as well. Yeah, thank you. Sheila? Yeah, no, I would really, I would echo um, what Nelson says and that um, the broadening out and understanding um, the kind of the legacies across the board are really, really important. And I think for, for us as well, I think it's really important that we understand that this isn't just something that we do in silos and that it's not just for the museum sector, or it's not just for education, but we really need to be having more conversations across the different, um, in, um, I can't think of the word there, but the different areas um, so that we kind of can get together to move, move all of this, this understanding of all of these histories forward. And so, yeah, um, for me, it's really, really important that we do that in a concerted way, that we talk to each other and that we kind of really make sure that, that the, the future generations have a much deeper understanding. Um, but also, for me, it's really, really important that we do that with, while working with um, the people in Scotland and understanding how things are on the ground for people and how we can actually be part of moving, um, improving people's lives. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. I'm just thinking about what, what Alex Renton said. Um, I, I, I think... I think Scotland as a whole and Edinburgh and the Highlands, perhaps in particular, suffer from being tourist destinations. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are stories we, we tell to tourists and the, the difficulty is we start believing them ourselves. I, I think we, we, <laughs> <laughs> and we, we need to find a way of breaking through that so that we have, and so, you know, and I think 25 years ago, that's what happened with the, 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 the Museum of Scotland. Mm -hmm. there, was, there, was, there was a narrative that, and the narrative was predetermined and it, it then dominated. So we, we've got to find ways of, of breaking through that. And, and so maybe we need to look to places that are dealing with difficult histories. And I mean, and there are, there are lots of them. But and I, I think I think Liverpool is a good mm -hmm. is a good example. Um, uh, but also, you know, Germany, how it how it deals yeah. with it with with its past, um, and that doesn't. And I think the reality is that doesn't frighten people away. I, th I think there is there is a respect you can earn for dealing mm -hmm. honestly with your past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's reminiscent of that James Baldwin comment that. Accepting your past is not the same as being chained to it. It's about learning how to use it. Um, well, can I thank you all uh, for your contributions, David Olson, um, Sheila, Sante, and Nelson Cummins, for your contribution to the panel, and as well as our partners in co-organising this, the Coalition for Race, Equality and Rights and Scotland's International Development Alliance, uh, and not forgetting our BSL interpreters um, who have joined us this afternoon. May, uh, may I take you this opportunity also to remind you that uh, there are many more um, cognate uh, events uh, at this year's Festival uh, of Politics, including In Conversation with John Barnes um, and... Um... Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, John, I'm a lifelong Liverpool supporter. I was really just proud of it. Uh, in Conversation with best-selling poet Lem, uh, uh, um, Lem Cisse. That's still on. Good. Um, <laughs> the State of the UK Union, uh, just to name two, formerly three. Um, and I'm also contractually obligated by my publisher to tell you there are copies of The Cruel Optimism of Racial Justice, in which I try and cover some of these topics uh, for sale in the lobby. Uh, feel free to walk directly past it uh, and, enjoy, <laughs> and enjoy the rest of your weekend. And thank you again for coming uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>